The first man to report a flying saucer was a veteran pilot named Kenneth Arnold. On the afternoon of June 24 Arnold was flying a private plane on his way from Chehalis to Yakima. Above the Cascade Mountains at about 9,200 feet, he noticed a series of bright flashes in the sky off to his left. Looking for the cause, he saw what appeared to be a formation of peculiar aircraft approaching Mount Rainier at fantastic speed. Talking with a reporter that evening, Arnold said that the objects flew like a saucer would if you skipped it across the water. Predictably, after so much publicity, a rash of similar sightings broke out all over the country and continued for the rest of the summer. At Oklahoma City, a private pilot told Air Force investigators he had seen a huge round object in the sky during the latter part of May. It was flying three times faster than a jet, he said, and without any sound. Citizens of Weezer, Idaho, described two strange fast-moving objects they had seen on June 12. The saucers were heading southeast, now and then dropping to a lower altitude, then swiftly climbing again. Several mysterious objects were reported flying at great speed near Spokane, just three days before Arnold's experience. And four days after his encounter, an Air Force pilot flying near Lake Mead, was startled to see half a dozen saucers flash by his plane. Even at this early point in the scare, official reports were contradicting each other. Just after Arnold's story broke, the Air Force admitted it was checking on the mystery disks. On July 4 the Air Force stated that no further investigation was needed, it was all hallucination. That same day, Wright Field told the Associated Press that the Air Materiel Command was trying to find the answer. The 4th of July was a red-letter day in the flying saucer mystery. At Portland, hundreds of citizens, including former Air Force pilots, police, harbor pilots, and deputy sheriffs, saw dozens of gleaming disks flying at high speed. The things, appeared to be at least 40,000 feet in the air, perhaps much higher. That same day, disks were sighted at Seattle, Vancouver, and other northwest cities. The rapidly growing reports were met with mixed ridicule and alarm. One of the skeptical group was Captain E.J. Smith, of United Airlines. I'll believe them when I see them, he told airline employees, before taking off from Boise the afternoon of the 4th. Just about sunset, his airliner was flying over Emmett, Idaho, when Captain Smith and his co-pilot, Ralph Stevens, saw five queer objects in the sky ahead. Smith rang for the stewardess, Marty Morrow, and the three of them watched the saucers for several minutes. Then four more of the disks came into sight. Though it was impossible to tell their size, because their altitude was unknown, the crew was sure they were bigger than the plane they were in. After about ten minutes the disks disappeared. The Air Force quickly denied having anything resembling the objects Captain Smith described. The Navy said it had made an investigation, and had no answers. There had been rumors that the disks were souped-up versions of the Navy's Flying Flakjack, a twin-engined circular craft known technically as the XF-5U-1. But the Navy insisted that only one model had been built, and that it was now out of service. On July 8 more disks were reported. Out at Milwaukee Air Force Base, where top-secret planes and devices are tested, six fast-moving silvery-white saucers were seen by pilots and ground officers. By this time, saucer reports had come in from almost 40 states. Alarm was increasing, and there were demands that radar be used to track the disks. The Air Force replied that there was not enough radar equipment to blanket the nation, but that its pilots were on the lookout for the saucers. The Maury Island mystery, a complex and eventually tragic affair, occurred near Tacoma, less than 100 miles from the place where Arnold had sighted the nine disks. In this mystery, too, Palmer was involved. According to their story, 
Two harbor patrolmen named Harold Dahl and Fred Chrisman on June 31 had observed a group of six flying discs that hovered over their boat near Maury Island and jammed their radio when they tried to notify the authorities. One of the discs had seemed to be disabled, had showered down lava-like metallic fragments that damaged the boat and killed the dog on board, the discs had then disappeared but the fragments remained as proof of the visit. The men also claimed to have taken some pictures that showed the six objects but were fogged as though by radiation. Back on shore, they had not telephoned the newspapers nor had they notified any government officials. Instead, they had mailed a box of the fragments to Ray Palmer, to prove that they had actually seen an accident to a flying saucer. Chrisman was no stranger to amazing stories. A science fiction fan, he apparently had accepted the Shaver stories as literal truth. More than a year before the Maury Island episode he had written to Palmer, warning him that the knowledge contained in the Shaver stories was too dangerous to print. Identifying himself as an ex-Air Force pilot who had flown the hump, Chrisman explained that when he was in Burma, he had been exploring a cave when a Dero attacked him with a mysterious ray that made a hole the size of a dime in his arm. Palmer had kept up the correspondence and, some months later, received a telephone call from Chrisman, then in Texas. For $250, said Chrisman, he would descend into a cave and take some actual pictures of the mysterious underground machines that Shaver had described. The result of this offer is not known, but in July 1947 Palmer received another letter from Chrisman, he had witnessed an accident to a flying saucer and was sending a box of the fragments as proof. Palmer considered buying the story for fate, but first he asked Arnold, living close to the scene, to investigate the tale. Arnold agreed. Thus the first man to report flying saucers became also a victim of the first flying saucer hoax. With an advance of $200 for expenses, Arnold flew to Tacoma and into a nightmare of mystery. The two men were elusive, their story full of discrepancies, their manner evasive. Wondering at first whether the affair was a hoax, Arnold finally attributed the strange behavior of the men to their fear of hostile sources. Alarmed, he called in the help of Army intelligence. Two officers arrived from Hamilton Air Force Base, and made a careful investigation. They found that Dahl and Chrisman were not harbor patrolmen but salvagers of floating lumber, their boat was scarcely seaworthy and showed no evidence of major repairs, they couldn't remember what they had done with the pictures they mentioned, and although the saucer accident was supposed to have occurred nearly six weeks earlier, they had never notified the authorities or even mentioned it to a reporter. The only evidence offered for the truth of their tale was the collection of strange fragments which were later found to be slag from a local smelter plant. Similar fragments could be found by the ton on Maury Island. The officers concluded that they had wasted their time on a flagrant hoax, but the bewildered Arnold insisted that they take some of the fragments for analysis. Unhappily, on the way back to the base the plane crashed and although two passengers parachuted to safety, both officers were killed. At once fantastic rumors sprang up, that the Tacoma discs had been spaceships, and that the beings who operated the craft had been forced, to arrange the plane crash, so that no one could analyze the fragments of their disabled spaceship. Arnold himself seemed to believe that the crash had resulted from extraplanetary sabotage, but investigation showed a more ordinary cause. A burned exhaust stack had set the left wing afire, the blazing wing had then broken from the fuselage and torn off the plane's tail. For a time government officials considered placing a charge of fraud against the two men who had started the unhappy chain of events. After further questioning, both had admitted that their sighting had been a hoax, planned merely to make their story more saleable, but when first Arnold and then military intelligence had entered the picture, the hoax had simply gotten out of hand. Since the men obviously had never intended the tragic outcome, and were not directly responsible for it, the idea of prosecution was abandoned. What did Kenneth Arnold actually see, that June afternoon in 1947? No absolutely certain answer is possible after so long a time. 
The discs were probably a mirage in which the peaks of the mountains seemed to float above the mountain chain. An alternative but much less probable explanation is that he observed orographic clouds, a type unique to mountainous country, which often appear to stand more or less motionless, and can assume dramatic shapes. Grindstone clouds, shaped like thick, solid disks, are common phenomena in the valleys just east of the Sierra Nevada in California, and in the mountainous regions of Washington, Colorado, and New Mexico, areas where flying saucer reports have tended to concentrate. No longer editor of Amazing, Palmer continued to promote the cause of flying saucers in the pages of Fate. During the early 1950s, the boom years of science fiction, he started other magazines, Search, Mystic Universe, Other Worlds, Science Stories. After a time, Fate began to concentrate on tales of the mystic and occult, while Other Worlds eventually took over the flying saucer theme. In December 1959 Palmer announced in a lead article that flying saucers were not from outer space after all, instead, they came from secret Earth bases located under the North and the South Poles. The Earth is actually shaped like a donut, not like a pear, he says, and has openings at both poles where the saucer people reside. In the autumn of 1962, Arnold entered the arena of politics and was the Republican nominee for Lieutenant Governor of Idaho, but lost. Shaver became a dairy farmer, a Wisconsin neighbor of Palmer's, but in science fiction circles his name will never die. He spent the rest of his life advertising the sale of alleged pre-deluge and pre-ice age art stones described as rare, voluptuous, exciting, and usable as ornaments for wall or mantle, or simply as book ends. At the 10th Annual World Science Fiction Convention, held in Chicago in September 1952, fans and fellow editors awarded to Palmer a bronze plaque honoring him as a son of science fiction, a citation he fully merited. As long as flying saucers continue to make good copy and sell magazines, Palmer's energy will probably keep them soaring, whether their home bases are other planets or polar caves.